Well, this evening uh, we are, are, as I've said before, continuing the theme that we began this morning on how we should not uh, love the world, but rather we should love the things of the kingdom of heaven, that we, sh we shouldn't seek to be like the world, but rather to be transformed into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the text that I would like for us to look at this evening is Romans 12, 1 and 2, which again deals with this subject. Paul writes to the church at Rome, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. May the Lord bless this portion of His Word to our understanding this evening. Now again, just want to remind you that this evening, that, or excuse me, this morning, that we were looking at the fact that if we want to be the kind of man or woman or child that is pleasing to the Lord, we have to have a heart for Him. We have to love what it is He loves. We have to hate what it is He hates. We have to have a heart like His. As a matter of fact, that's why the Lord redeemed us, so that we might have a heart like His. That's why He gave us His Holy Spirit, to produce that kind of character in us. Now, what we've seen so far is if we are to have such a heart, we can't love those things that are the opposite of God. We cannot love what He hates. We saw, first of all, that we cannot love the world or the things that are in the world. And we realize that John was not referring to the physical world. Uh, even though it is fallen, there's still a great amount of beauty in it, and it still reveals the Lord in so many ways. But he was referring to those things that are in the world that are contrary to God. We cannot love the things, he says, that appeal to our sin nature, the things that would entice us or our flesh. We are, are not to have our eyes fixed upon the things of the world to desire them. And we are not to desire uh, the glory of the world, or at least, you know, glory for ourselves, great things for ourselves, the boastful pride of life. Because to the degree that we do desire any of these things and give in to these things, to that degree, we basically quench or extinguish, and we're not entirely extinguish, I think quench is a better word, uh, the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. And to that degree, we become then more like the world and less like God, and so we'll have less of a heart for Him. Now, if that's not what you want, if you don't want to be like the world, if you would rather become something more like those whom the Lord called His friends, those whom He loved, those whom He used for His glory, then you do need to operate on different principles. You can't have the same desires as those of the world or desire the things of the world. You have to have those which are of the Spirit. Instead of desiring fleshly things, you have to desire spiritual things. Instead of fixing your eyes on the world, you need to fix them on the things of heaven or the kingdom of heaven. And instead of seeking great things for yourselves, you need to humble yourself and seek great things for God. That's what glorifies Him. And that, of course, is what our Lord Jesus Christ did, and that is the image that we are predestined to become conformed to. That is the one we are to be becoming like. So this evening, what I'd like us to do from this text is consider two further things that we need to do in order to grow into this image. And I think they're quite obvious in the text that I've just read. First of all, we are not to be conformed to this world. We are not to allow ourselves to be shaped by this world. But rather, we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds as the Spirit of God would use the Word of God to make us more like our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's consider this for a few moments. And first of all, let's consider that we are called by the Lord not to be conformed 
to the world. Now, what does it mean to conform or to be conformed to something? Uh, the word literally means to be shaped by or to live after the pattern of something, uh, to become like it. Now, Paul here is obviously warning us that if we are to become more like our Lord Jesus Christ, we must not allow ourselves to be shaped by the world. We can't let it influence us. We can't let it dictate to us how it is we are to live. Now, we have to uh, stop for a moment and again and consider why it is that we would even allow such a thing. I mean, why would we want to be conformed to the world in the first place? Well, the only reason why we ever want to be conformed to anything is because we see something in it that is desirable. Again, there's a degree to which we love it. And we know what that's like because sometimes, you know, we, we see people, especially I think the temptation for us is to become uh, like those who are in the world. We, we see a person that, that we admire. We see certain things in that individual and we want to be like that individual. And when we see somebody like that, I think the first thing we try to do is we begin to put on what it is we see in them that we like. We try to imitate them. We try to act like them, perhaps dress like them or look like them because in some degree we want to become like them. I could use a, a personal example of this, my younger and, and foolish days. There was a group of us, and I'm talking about several decades ago, uh, <laughs> when we were in our teens, I mean, the, the, uh, you know, the, the movies, that, as it were, that were really popular uh, were the Dirty Harry movies, and I'll have to say they had a lot of effect on us as youth. You know, we saw Harry, we wanted to be like Harry, wanted to act like Harry, wanted to talk like Harry. And of course, my friends who were into guns wanted a gun like Harry's, you know, a, a Smith & Wesson 44 Magnum and so forth, okay? So again, we, we saw something that, that we liked. We thought if we could be like that, we would be somebody. And so we began trying to put on those characteristics, make what we saw part of our own character. Now, that could be a good thing if what we're seeking to imitate is a good thing. I mean, Paul writes, for instance, in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, he says, Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. If what we see is good and what we want to imitate is good, well, that's a good thing. But we need to realize that what we want to imitate could also be bad it's if, if, again, what we're seeking to imitate is bad. We need to be careful then what we allow ourselves to love or to admire. If what we're admiring is something that is sinful, it's obviously going to pull us into the wrong direction. We need to be careful not to let the world shape us. The way that it shapes us is if our heart goes after it, we see things in it that we like, that we want to put on, and we seek to imitate that. But again, if it's something that is sinful, it is going to hurt us. We are not to be conformed to the world. Now, that's also why the Lord warns us against forming close relationships with those who are in the world. Because if we spend time with those who are worldly, we are going to become more like them. I mean, why would we spend time with somebody who is worldly except, again, that desire in our heart for something that is wrong? Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15.33 that if we do this, it is going to corrupt us because we're going to become conformed to those we spend time with. He says, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. And Solomon reminds us that the principle works both ways. If we spend time with those who are godly, we will become more godly. If we spend time with those who are evil, we'll become more evil. Proverbs 13, 20, he who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. And that's why Paul will later write in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, warning us to be careful with our relationships with those who are in the world. He says, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? 
Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. The more time we spend, you know, admiring the world, the more we're going to conform to the world, the more time we spend with unbelievers enjoying their company, the more we're going to be uh, tempted to be conformed to what they are. Paul tells us, do not be conformed to this world. Do not love the world or the things in the world. Do not want to be like those who are in the world because if you do, you will become like them. Whatever is in your heart, that's what you're going to be drawn to. It's going to mold you and shape you. It's going to conform you. So what I'm saying is basically this that if we are not to be conformed to the world, if we're going to avoid being shaped by the world, then we have to do what John told us this morning, and that is not love the world. We have to instead love the Lord. Obviously, that's what's going to draw us out to Him and make us more like Him and give us a heart that is more like His. So what is it we can do from this text to fight against the desire to conform to the world? Well, we have to do those things that are going to cause our love for the Lord to increase. The things the Spirit of God uses to draw our love out and to build that love up so that we will become more like that one whom we are to love the most. Now again, we do have several things that are working against us. Among which certainly is the fact that, um, you know, we've, before we came to the Lord, we were in this world walking, as we saw this morning, according to the prince of the power of the air. We were the children of wrath, even as the rest, which means that we were seeking the things the world seeks. We were doing the things that John tells us we shouldn't do. So we have, we had at least adopted a, a lot of thinking and desires which, which are wrong. And we may not have even known that they were wrong, but certainly they were. And certainly having lived in this world for a while, we had already conformed to it to some degree. And even after having been saved, you know, being saved by the Lord, we're still uh, in this world and a part of us still wants to be conformed to it. So what can we do to reverse this process and to become less like the world and more like the Lord? Well, we need to allow the Spirit of God to work through the Word of God to make us more like our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, we've seen we need to love the Lord more. That will draw our heart out more towards Him and less toward the world. Well, how can we love the Lord more? Well, first of all, we can do it, Paul says, by a consideration of the mercies that God has given to us. Remember that the Spirit of God is the one who has authored the Word and the Spirit of God is the one who's going to use the Word to make us more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the things that He will do is He will point out to us, of course, what the Lord has done for us to ingratiate us, to make us love Him more. When Paul writes this, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, he's actually pointing back to the first 11 chapters uh, in, in which he wrote all those things that we ought to be endeared to God for. And let me just review a couple of these things or a few of these things because these things were also true of us. Remember that though that's what we used to be, we used to be in this world and we used to be loving the world and conforming to the world, we need to remember what that meant with regard to our future. When we were outside of Christ and spiritually dead, we weren't seeking God, but we were children of wrath, as we saw this morning. And what that means is that we were under God's wrath and would have suffered that wrath for all eternity 
if the Lord had not changed our hearts. But remember what God did. Even while you were His enemy, He sent His Son to save you. He sent His Son to live and to die for you. When you were dead in your trespasses and sins, He made you alive. Purely by His own good pleasure, sovereignly by His grace, He raised you up and changed your heart and put your feet on the path of life. He gave you a future. Remember the mercies that He continues to give to you day by day. Every good thing that you get comes from the Lord. Even the grace that you need to continue to walk with Him day by day. You know the Lord Jesus Christ is in heaven continually praying for you and cleansing you of all of your faults and sanctifying you and making you more like Him. And His grip on you is so tight that there is nothing in heaven or earth that could possibly separate you from Him. You cannot be lost if you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's something, again, that is purely by the mercy of God. And remember what it is that God has promised to do for you. He is going to bring you to heaven someday. I mean, we think of death as a bad thing, but remember the Apostle Paul looked at death as something to be welcomed because he could be with Christ, which is very much better. What's going on in heaven is much better than what's going on here on earth. Well, the Lord has provided for you. He's, he's going to take care of you. He's going to bring you to heaven, and He's going to love you and care for you for all eternity so that the things that we're most concerned about on earth, you know, who's, are, are my needs going to be provided for? Am I going to be healthy? Is it going to be well with me? All those things are taken care of in heaven and provided for so that you don't need to worry about a thing. There is no cares, no concerns, no suffering, no tears, nothing but pure happiness, pure love, something that increases throughout all eternity. Well, Paul says, think about these many mercies. Think about the many ways that you are indebted to the Lord. Uh, let the Spirit of God bring these things to your mind and show you how much you should love Him how much more you should love Him and how much less you should love the world because this will give you less of a desire to be conformed to those things that this one who has shown you so many mercies, he hates these things. And if he hates these things, the one who has loved you and given you all these things, well, shouldn't you hate them as well? And so be less conformed, not conformed to the world, but instead have a greater desire to be transformed into His image. Well, secondly, considering these mercies, you need to yield to the Spirit of God and commit your life to the Lord. Paul tells us here that we should offer ourselves up as living sacrifices, a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. On the basis of everything the Lord has done for you, He calls you now to offer yourselves to Him, to commit your life to Him, to live for Him. That should be the direction of your heart. So instead of leaving room in your life to give yourself to the world, you are to give yourself to Him continually, pick up your cross and follow Him as He calls you to do. I don't know if you've read the book of Romans uh, lately, but Paul has a very interesting, um, I might call it an argument in, in chapter 6 of the book of Romans, where he, he tells us how it is we should view ourselves on the basis of what the Lord has actually done for us. He says that you have died with Christ, you have been buried with Christ, at the same time you have died to sin, which means you have died to this world but you have also been raised up with the Lord Jesus Christ now to live for Him. So Paul says, how should you view yourself and how should you view your life in this world? Well, he says, view yourselves as those who were dead but have been raised again to life now to live for God's glory and His alone. Just, just think about that. We died when we trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. We were buried with Him when we were basically baptized into Him by the Holy Spirit. And we were dead, 
dead, and we are dead, to uh, ourselves, to our old way of living, to our old desires, again, all of which are what John tells us are the things we shouldn't love. And we have been raised again spiritually to newness of life so that we live now as those alive from the dead, no longer to yield our members as instruments of unrighteousness, no longer uh, giving ourselves to be conformed to the world, but now we live to yield our members as instruments of righteousness to serve the Lord, to honor Him, to live the kind of life that He wants us to live. This is to be our only reason for living. So the fact that uh, the Lord has given us this command, he has, he has done this work within us, we are to offer ourselves up as living sacrifices, give ourselves wholly to Him. This is what the Spirit of God within us is moving us to do as He makes us more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, thirdly, Paul tells us that we need to allow the Spirit of God to renew our minds in His Word. Now, Paul certainly here, as he's writing to a Christian audience, he assumes the Spirit of God is already at work in their hearts, but he points out to them that this renewal is not going to go on without the words. Okay, we need to um, renew our minds by the Word of God. That's the only way we can is by the truth of God. Now, is the Spirit of God living in us enough to do this work? Well, certainly we need the Spirit of God because we can't become like Jesus Christ apart from Him. But remember, the Spirit of God today doesn't communicate to us um, uh, content or truth apart from the Word of God. This is the Word that He has authored. This is the standard. This is the foundation. This is the truth of God. This is what the Lord uses. We need to realize that even in the day when the Lord was actually communicating truth to certain individuals directly, what we call inspiration. We were looking at that uh, in our uh, new members class this morning. He didn't do that for everyone. It's not like every Christian was walking with this understanding of what God wanted them to do directly communicated by the Spirit of God. Christians in those days, the vast majority of them, had to use the Word of God. That's why Paul directs Timothy to the Word. You know, the Word of God is, is or the all Scripture is, is God-breathed and profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction. He doesn't say, just wait on the Spirit and He'll tell you, but He points them to the Word of God because that's what the Spirit of God uses. And now that inspiration has ceased, now that the Word of God is complete, it's, it's even, you know, we might say even more true today. Everyone who is going to um, understand what it is God wants us to do has to find out from the Word of God. And the Spirit needs for us to read the Word so that He will have the truth to work with. Now, as I've said before, when the Lord saved us, He saved us out of a situation where we've already been in the world for some time. We had already been influenced it in several different areas. And when He saved us, He didn't take us out of the world. He didn't put us in a perfect environment, but He left us in the world. And we have to continue in it for a while, which means the potential still exists for us to be influenced by the world. So how can we continue in the world, immersed in its influences, at least to the degree that we have to be, and unlearn the things that we've learned and be transformed into the image of Christ to keep ourselves from learning more of the world's ways and at the same time learn what it is that we need to honor and glorify God. Well, there's only one way, and that's by being in the Word of God. You know, I've already referred to the Word this evening as what the Scripture sometimes refers to it. That is water, the washing of the water of the Word. And it's referred to as water because of its ability to wash us, uh, to cleanse us in certain ways. Certainly when we embrace the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we are washed of all of our sins because of the blood of Jesus. But the water washes us in a different way. It's able to cleanse the old way of thinking out of our minds and replace it 
with a right way of thinking. And the Lord wants us to come to the Word and to be cleansed by the Word. How often do you um, get into the shower and, and wash the dirt off your bodies, the dirt of the world? Well, I think most of us tend to do it on a daily basis. But how often do you get into the Word and wash your souls, wash the dirt of the world's thinking out of your minds and cleanse it with that pure water of the Word of God? Well, I think you understand this is something you need to do often. You need to immerse yourselves in the Word, cleanse your mind with the Word, read it daily, understand it, understand what it is that the Lord is showing to you, get, get the whole picture. You have to renew your thinking, and the Word of God is the only way you can do it. So I would encourage you to read the Word on a daily basis, you know, in your devotions, or, as you know, as a church, we're going through the reading the Bible together, and that gives us the opportunity actually to help one another in this area. As I understand, we, we do have the means of communicating with one another, the insights that we get. And sometimes when one brother or sister points out something in the Word that was meaningful to them, it can also be a, a blessing to us. So read the Bible. Read it daily. Get into it. Understand it. Uh, study it, apply it, um, hear it, of course, preach, come to the worship services and subject yourselves to what it is we're doing right now, which is spending time trying to understand the Word and having it applied so that, again, we are, we are cleansed and washed of our old way of thinking and we put on the new way of thinking. Or come to the Bible studies as well as we gather midweek studying Pilgrim's Progress. I think it's given us some tremendous insights into the Word of God and things that are useful to us to help us go the right direction, to be cleansed of the world's thinking and to put on that that we should be thinking that is inspired by the Spirit of God. And of course, we gather once a month to uh, share those insights that the Lord has shown us as we read the Bible together. Come to those meetings and share what it is the Lord has shown you. Again, that you might help your brothers and sisters in the Lord grow. So be transformed in the renewing of your mind by studying the Word of God, understanding the Word of God, memorizing the Word of God, applying the Word of God, believing what it is that it says. Again, I don't know if I can overemphasize this. This is the only way to renew our minds, the Word of God. We've got to be in the Word. If we're not, we're simply going to be influenced by the world and continue to go that direction. Don't expect renewal unless you're in the Word. The more you're in the Word, the more your mind will be washed, the more that the basically truth the Spirit of God will have to work with, and the more your life will be transformed. You know, the Scripture says that we should expect to hear the Lord to tell us if we are earnestly seeking Him, this is the way, walk in it. But how does the Lord do that? He does it by the Word that is in our minds. Thankfully, God has given to us the ability to read, understand, and remember certain things. But the Spirit of God can take the things, even the things we've forgotten, and He can bring them back to our minds and help us to apply them when we need them. I remember one of my seminary professors, as we were looking at all this information that's you know, going through things that we, oh, we love to remember this, one of them said, well, don't expect to take more than 20% out of seminary of everything you're exposed to. Well, 20%. I want it all. You know, I want to remember all of it. Well, we had another professor remind us. He says, you may not remember everything you've been taught. But just remember, the Spirit of God is able to bring it to your mind when you need it, and you know that that's true. But it's got to be in your mind to begin with, okay? You've got to study it. You've got to read it. You've got to learn it, okay? And, and that way, the Spirit of God can use it in your life. So don't expect this to happen if you're not in the words. You've got to be in the Word of God. And then finally, realize that if you don't do this, 
You know, if you don't think again about the mercies of God, if you, don't, if you don't have that willingness to present yourselves to the Lord as His servants alive from the dead, if you're not willing to read the Word of God and understand what it is that the Lord really wants you to do, then you're never going to be able clearly to see what God's will is for your life. I think that's what Paul has in mind when he says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is. That which is good and acceptable and perfect. Do you want to know what it is that God wants you to do? Do you want to know what it is that, you know, the kind of life He wants you to live and to know that clearly? You can only do that if you are in the Word of God. If, if these things Paul is talking about here are true of you, if you are moved by His mercies, if you're willing to give yourself to Him, willing to do His will, um, Jesus says, and you'll know the doctrine, whether it be of God or not. And if you are in the Word of God, renewing your mind. Because if you're not doing these things, then basically you're still going to be in love with the world, still going to be captivated by the world. Your mind is still going to be filled with the ideas of the world. And so you are going to continually be conforming to the world. And as long as that is happening in your life, your spiritual sight will be clouded and you will not have a clear view of what it is He wants. Nor are you going to be very, very easily be convinced by others of what God wants. And you're not going to be able easily to convince yourself that you're really not doing what God wants you to do as long as you love the world and are desiring the world and conforming to the world. You've got to separate yourself from the world, not be conformed with it. If you want a heart for God, you must fall out of love with the world and more in love with the Lord. So let's take this as an admonition from the Lord this evening. This is so very important. Allow the Spirit of God to do these things in your life. Meditate on the mercies of God. You know, we're going to be singing a hymn in just a few minutes that... Um, reminds us of, again, that very simple fact that um, we're never really going to know how much we owe God until uh, we, we stand before Him on Judgment Day and judgment is over and we see the wicked standing on the precipice, you know, being ready to be cast into the lake of fire forever. That, that's going to happen. There's going to be a lot of people in the lake of fire. As Robert Murray McShane reminds us, we're not going to know till then just how much we really do owe the Lord. But yet we can know by faith because God's Word tells us that's going to happen. It's not going to have the same impact. But we can still know to, to some degree what we owe the Lord, and that should move us. We should give ourselves more to the Lord as a continual sacrifice. We have to do that because of what God calls us to do. That's why He saved us. And we need to be in the Word of God. If we do these things, then we will see clearly what it is God wants us to be, and we will have the power to actually be conformed to that rather than being conformed to the world. Well, may the Lord give us ears to hear His Word this evening and His grace to do what He calls us to do. Let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask that the Lord would help us to do this.